So Dr. Morales, when you're prescribing uh, the SGLT2 class of medications to a patient, any thoughts or concerns or extra education that you provide about anything they need to look for or monitor? So I think what's important to recognize is that this particular class of drugs tends to act like a thiazide-like diuretic. So in my clinical practice, if I'm using, let's say, a combination antihypertensive therapy that includes either an ACE or an ARB in combination with a diuretic, I would probably peel away the diuretic and then institute the SGLT2 inhibitor. And I'm doing so because I'm trying to avert um, dehydration, especially since the, the, the class of drug does have a diuretic effect, but also hypotension. Mm -hmm. And even though there's significant benefit that's noted in this particular class of drugs, patients that are elderly who may experience hypotension could have the potentials of falling and sustaining injury, maybe even a hip fracture. But again, I think it's important to take that into consideration and practice safely. Now, I know that there is also some concerns, particularly with uh, genital urinary tract issues that have arisen and has been described in patients with this class of medications. And these include mycotic genital infections, which occurs more so in women and in uncircumcised men. There's really no way to avert the risk of this happening other than drinking a lot of fluid, trying to avoid barrier protection, and learning to um, uh, identify and treat a little bit sooner rather than later. Now, one of the things that, that, that yeah. patients actually ask me, um, and also other clinicians, is if you have somebody that has, let's say, a mycotic infection, do they need to stop the SGLT2 inhibitor while they're being treated? And I usually tell them, no. Stay on the medication, it's working, but just treat the mycotic infection, it'll be fine. And I think that's a really good point and a counseling point that I tell patients because where I am at, I see predominantly um, male geriatric patients because we have a women's health clinic where they're seen by a female provider. Um, the mycotic infections in males is not something that's common, so they don't know look, to look for it when it does happen, and that's happened even on the front lines of the clinicians that are looking at it that might be coming in through urgent care um, or the ER where they'll ask for a urine sample, you'll, they'll do a catch, they'll look for a urinary tract infection, nothing there, but you know, the well, physical exam may have not been done. And so again, you know, just educating that patient on proper hygiene is important. Um, and I agree with, you know, the earlier points regarding, you know, volume status is important to look at. Renal function we've talked about earlier, uh, just because you're gonna have some intravascular volume contraction. And one question that surfaced a lot with uh, my patients recently is regarding some amputation risk. And, you know, they're like, oh, I saw a commercial on TV, and usually that's how it unfolds. Um, and, you know, there is, and they're, within the class, they're not all, uh, created equal from a safety standpoint. We've agreed that you know some cardiovascular benefits seem to be a class effect, but specifically there's an amputation risk, uh, specifically with uh, coniglifosin, which patients do come in and present with. And so that's something that to be mindful of and making sure that um, you kind of address that head on versus them reading about it, hearing about it later, because that could put um, you know different impression of it in their mind. Um, so making sure that both sides of the drug are covered. And I think it's important to recognize, though, I mean, in terms of those that did experience amputation as described, in that particular trial, I believe about 2% of these patients wound up having established peripheral vascular disease, and those that were at greatest risk of amputation had already had previous amputations already. So I think that that's important to recognize what the risk factor actually is, and it's not like you know, uh, a typical patient is going to be at significant risk. It's obviously going to be the greater risk individual with established peripheral vascular disease or prior amputation who may be at risk. Well, that reminds me that the number one cause of amputation, blindness, and chronic kidney disease is diabetes. So let's not forget that tackling this disease state is one of the most important public health endeavors that we have.